So this is the last of the Nobel series. There are three talks, uh, six weeks, um, six talks, six weeks. And uh, we did make them every week. And I think that was a good strategy compared to the uh, year before when they were every month and people kind of lost the thread of what the Nobel series was really all about. It's worked extraordinarily well this, this year. And I'm very, very grateful to uh, David and today's speaker, Belme, uh, Elkins for their contributions because uh, because David did economics and the Peace Prize and Belme today is winning the economics prize. Uh, far better, sorry, to be, is, is doing the literature prize, literature prizes, literature prizes. So I'm very, very pleased about that uh, because I remember last year panicking and, uh, and actually with some relief finding out that there was a literature prize <laughs> last year. So, um, so let's just review where we've come from in just a few minutes because the physics prize, remember that, James Peebles, not Pebbles, right? <laughs> And uh, Michael Bear and Didier Quillard. So remember what that was all about? It was, it was about the first 500,000 year, uh, years of the universe from the Big Bang forward. So the very formation of the first star systems and galaxies and what that was all about, but also the finding of the first planet outside of our solar system. And now they're in the many thousands. And that's only looking at a tiny little window in our spiral arm of our Milky Way. So you can imagine what the numbers are like. So that's why those prizes were given. Then the chemistry prize. Uh, John uh, Goodenough, interesting name, Stanley Whittingham, and Hashino, um, uh, who um, are really, it was really more of an engineer's prize than a chemistry prize, but uh, a lot of chemistry too. And, uh, but it was really the evolution of, or the development of the lithium battery. And that, that was very important. I was actually helped in that because uh, one of my best friends is, um, is an electrical engineer at Western. So that helped me. Then the medicine prize, which I personally found the most challenging. William Kalin, Peter Ratcliffe, and Greg uh, Semenza. Um, because that was all about hypoxia and how uh, it's an ancient system for detecting lower levels of oxygen and uh, how does that work and how does it work in pathological conditions and is, is it a factor in the development of cancer? It is and, uh, and that, was, uh, that was certainly very interesting. And I don't really presume to step on David Elkins uh, feet with Reviewing the economics prize, but David did an excellent job with that. And um, because what I found most intriguing, and I think you did too, was that it was that the award was really given for this uh, um, novel, experimental, call it scientific approach to analyzing uh, the impact of uh, changes, social changes, economic changes on the welfare of people. And, and that, that was really an extraordinary uh, thing to single that out for a prize. And then the Peace Prize, uh, last week by David again, Ethiopian Prime Minister Ebi Ahmed. And um, I won't say much more about that because that will be in your memory, but uh, um, but that too was very, very interesting because unlike the science awards, which came 20 years after doing the work, this one came within what one or two years. 18 months. Yeah. So, uh, so it's uh, so that was a very different perspective. Now our speaker today is um, uh, Belme Elkins, and uh, Belme is a published author and. Um, and really has had uh, uh, at least two directions. In the early part, uh, Elmay has had a very um, persuasive interest in, in birthing and, uh, and the support for women and the rights of women in birthing and, uh, and a right to have a natural birth, so to speak, or uh, in hospital, right? And, uh, 
and and that was a that, that's been a major interest of hers. But um, but she's also uh, wrote a really interesting book last year, um, uh, which she gave me a, gave several of us a copy of but, but reconstructing Mabel, and it's a it's a marvelous um, account. Uh, but they they spent part of the year in Santa Fe about a about a particular woman there out there. So I'm not going to give away the story except that it's very well told by Belme. And then she shared with me uh, the uh, copy of the Bennington Review, and uh, Belme spent some very uh, formative time in Bennington. It's a college in Vermont. Um, learning about writing. And this uh, review comes out annually, and she had a wonderful article in it. The uh, title was Hunger. So Belmay has a lot of talent, and a lot of proven talent, and uh, but she's also been a book reviewer and many other things. So Belmay, I'm not gonna encroach you any more on your time. And you have as long as you want to speak. <laughs> well, this is all on YouTube, by the way. So we don't have the same restrictions we do with Portugal. So Belme, yeah. all yours. <laughs> thank you so much, Bill. And thank you for the series. I've learned a lot. I've enjoyed the series. Thank you, David. Thank you, Bill. And uh, thank you for inviting me to talk about the Nobel Prize in Literature. Today is a very exciting day. 123 years ago uh, was the death, December the 10th, of Alfred Nobel. And at exactly this time in Stockholm today, December the 10th, we have the award ceremony for the Nobel Prizes because there is a six hour difference. The weather in Stockholm is 25 degrees Fahrenheit and light snow is predicted. And the presentations are occurring in the concert hall. Now, I thought it would be very interesting before I talked about the winners for 2018 and 2019 to look into Alfred Nobel a little more closely. We know that he was a chemist, he was an engineer, he had 355 patents, and he invented dynamite. He was a philanthropist. He left in his will approximately 250 million for the Nobel Prizes, but we don't know quite so much about his interest in literature. We know that the Peace Prize was brought about by his relationship with Bertha von Sutter, and uh, she won the first Peace Prize in 1905. Alfred Nobel, by the time he was 17, spoke five languages. He taught himself French by reading Voltaire, and in his 40s, he headed off to Paris. Now, this was 1851, and it was the time, the heyday, coming into the literary salon. And his friend Juliette invited him to the literary salons of Paris, where he met luminaries such as Victor Hugo, uh, de Maupassant, a whole range of them. And he was a great fan of Victor Hugo's. He sent Hugo, for his 83rd birthday, uh, a letter which said, uh, Congratulations, O oh great master. Uh, may you go on and continue your work with universal charity. Now, Nobel also loved classical poetry. His favorite poet was Lord Byron. He loved the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen. And when he died, he left a library of 1,500 volumes many of them in the original languages. And in his later days, he moved from Paris to San Remo, his later days being young by my standards. He was in his late 50s uh, and died in his early 60s. 
he began to write in San Remo, and I thought it might be interesting to look at some of his early writings uh, late in life. And he started off with a riddle, and it was dedicated to a lovely girl wedded to her grave. And he said, you say, I am a riddle. It may be, for all of us are riddles, unexplained. Begun in pain, in deeper torture ended. This breathing clay, what business has it here? He also had wonderful little sayings, and he said, a recluse without books and ink is in life already a dead man. <laughs> I like that particular. <laughs> he also said, hope is nature's veil for hiding truth's nakedness. And I like this little one. Second to agriculture, humbug is the biggest industry of our age. <laughs> <laughs> now, he went on to write a novel, The Brightest Africa, which is a book of social criticism. Let's keep that in mind. He was known for his skepticism, and he was a great critic of the justice system. He said, justice has paralysis of the legs and therefore moves very slowly. <laughs> He uh, also wrote uh, in his latter years a handful of poems and a satirical novel. And he uh, described in one of his novels a luxurious suite of rooms where people can go to commit suicide rather than the retro problems we perhaps associate in literature with suicide. So he was a skeptic. And we have to keep that in mind. Uh, he was a big believer in social justice, but in a rather unconventional way. And as we look at the Nobel Prizes this year, I thought this would be very relevant. Now, he left the prize to be awarded to a work in, an outstanding work in literature in an idealistic direction. Now, idealistic. Did he mean of high moral value, or did he mean something else completely? And this is also very, very important when we look at the prize winners. A few facts on the background of the Nobel Prize in Literature. There have been 116 prizes awarded. 101 of those have been men, and 15 women. And most of them have been awarded for a lifetime's literary work. T.S. Eliot quipped that a Nobel Prize is a nail in an author's coffin. <laughs> Since most of the Nobel Prize winners have been in their 70s and even 80s, our own uh, Alice Munro uh, got the award in 2013 at age 82. And in parenthesis there, Alice Munro said that she is no longer writing, she's 88, and she said, but at this time and age, I am not so much interested in writing, uh, I do not choose to be alone uh, for the long periods of time required for writing, but prefer to seek company. So, there have been some awards given for a single work, one of them being Ernest Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea. Uh, uh, Faulkner won a single award for the Forsyth Saga, and uh, Knut Hamsun for The Growth of the Soil. Now, the awards have been occasionally associated with scandal. Knut Hamsun, who won his award in 1920, was drunk and disorderly, and apparently pulled the whiskers of one of the members of the Swedish Academy. But this is small potatoes compared to where we've gone in the last few years with scandal associated with the Nobel Prize for Literature. Have any of you seen the Irving Wallace movie, The Prize? 
or read the book. It was made in 1962, and it's Paul Newman, a gorgeous young Paul Newman role right there. Uh, this doesn't follow the formula for the Nobel Prize in Literature. <laughs> and in one of the final scenes, there's the um, inevitable chase, and the writer, who is a young American writer, Andrew Craig, goes through and performs all sorts of acrobatic feats, leaping across on a fishing net onto the deck of a Russian, uh, sorry, a German boat bound for Leningrad. And once again, that would be unlikely. One thing which is quite likely is that uh, he confesses that he hasn't really written anything for seven years. He's been working on a novel, but meanwhile, he's been uh, uh, earning a living writing uh, detective novels under a pseudonym, and I think this is quite powerful, great literature these days. So, coming on to Scandal, 2018's Nobel Award, uh, Award in Literature was cancelled. Now, why was it cancelled? Because of Scandal, and I'm not going to go too much into this, you can read um, you know, People Magazine or whatever, but uh, <laughs> apparently one of the husband of one of the members of the, uh, the Academy uh, had allegations of sexual misconduct, 18 uh, accusations, including rape. And not only that, there was financial misconduct. Apparently, uh, he, the husband of one of the Academy members, had a club forum uh, where readings were given and cultural activities, and apparently some of the funds from the Nobel Prize found their way into the club forum. <laughs> also, it appeared that he had leaked some of the names of the uh, Nobel laureates to a betting system uh, from which he benefited financially. <laughs> and so the Academy deemed it appropriate to not award a prize in literature and give the uh, award time to resume its dignity. Well, <laughs> this year's award winners uh, are also associated with scandal. Uh, the first, the 2019 award, goes to the 78-year-old Austrian uh, playwright and poet and essay writer and novelist. Peter Huntley. And right now, outside the music hall in Stockholm, there are probably several hundred people protesting his award. Now, why? Huntley wrote a book in the 60s, sorry, in the 90s, called Journey Across the Rivers justice for Serbia. And to look at this book, which has caused all the scandal, we need to go back and look at the background of the poet Peter, um, and writer uh, Peter Huntley. Now, he's considered one of Austria's most prominent authors. He has won a series of awards, including uh, a recent one, uh, the Nestroy uh, Prize in Austria for uh, the best, for a lifetime of theatrical, of theatrical writing. He studied to be a lawyer, he quit law, and at age 24, he leapt into the category of enfant terrible and provocateur with a play offending the audience. And I thought we might begin by doing a little offending the audience. And we're going to have just tiny sections of this. It's a very short play, and here are some of the rules for the actors. Listen to the litanies in the Catholic churches. Listen to football teams being cheered on and booed. Listen to the rhythmic chanting at demonstrations. Listen to the wheels of a bicycle upturned on its seat, spinning until the spokes have come to rest and watch the spokes until they have reached their resting point. Listen to the gradually increasing noise a concrete mixer makes after the motor has been started. Listen to debaters cutting each other off. 
Listen to Tell Me by the Rolling Stones. Listen to the simultaneous arrival and departure of trains. Listen to the hit parade on Radio Luxembourg. Listen in on the simultaneous interpreters of the United Nations. Listen to the dialogue between the gangster and the pretty girl in the trap when the girl asks the gangster how many more people he intends to kill, whereupon the gangster asks as he leans back how many are left, and watch the gangster as he says it. See the Beatles movies. In a hard day's night, watch Ringo smile at the moment when, after having been teased by the others, he sits down at his drums and begins to play. Watch Gary Cooper's face in The Man from the West. In the same movie, watch the death of the mute as he runs down the deserted street of the lifeless town with a bullet in him, hopping and jumping and emitting those shrill screams. Watch monkeys aping people and llamas spitting in the zoo. Watch the behavior of bums and idlers as they amble on the street and play machines in the Penny Arcade. Now, continuing with offending the audience, we are not putting anything over on you. We don't imitate. We don't represent any other persons and any other events, even if they statistically exist. We can do without a play of features and a play of gestures. There are no persons who are part of the plot and therefore no impersonators. The plot is not freely invented for there is no plot. Since there is no plot, accidents are impossible. Similarity with still living or scarcely dead or long dead persons is not accidental but impossible. For we don't represent anything and are no others than we are. We don't even play ourselves. We are speaking. Nothing is invented here. Nothing is imitated. Nothing is fact. Nothing is left to your imagination. Before you leave, you will be offended. We will offend you because offending you is also one way of speaking to you. By offending you, we can be straight with you. We can switch on you. We can eliminate the free play. We can tear down a wall. We can observe you. You are accomplished actors, you hucksters, you traitors to your country, you grafters, you would-be revolutionaries, you reactionaries, you draft card burners, you ivory tower artists, you defeatists, you massive retaliators, you white rabbit pacifists, you nihilists, you individualists, you communists, you vigilantes, you socialists, you minutemen, you whiz kids, you turtle doves, you crazy hawks, you stool pigeons, you worms, you antediluvian monstrosities, you clackers, you click of babbits, you rabble, you blubber, you quivering reeds, you wretches, you offays, you oafs, you spooks, you black baiters, you cookie pushers, you abortions, you bitches and bastards, you nothings, you thingamajigs. <laughs> Did he offend the audience? <laughs> now, he went on, as the provocateur, the young playwright, to write another play, uh, the goalie's anxiety at the penalty kick, which took a dark little turn when the uh, protagonist murders uh, the um, usher in a cinema. And then in the 70s, his mother committed suicide. And this influenced everything to come and influenced the scandal outside the concert hall tonight. His mother was the most important person in his life, and she raised him when his father was away at war. He grew up in Austria, close to the, what was then the Yugoslavian border, and his mother was Slovenian. And his mother went through, she survived the Weimar Republic, she survived uh, the Nazi occupation, she survived the persecution of the Serbs uh, in Germany near the Yugoslavian border, and she uh, survived two world wars and the post-consumer society. And then in 1971, she took an overdose of sleeping pills, and 
Peter Hankin wrote A Sorrow Beyond Dreams, and his work is largely autobiographical. He says, as usual, when engaged in literary work, this is seven weeks after his mother's death, I am alienated from myself and transformed into an object, a remembering and formulating machine. I am writing the story of my mother. First of all, because I think I know more about her and how she came to her death than any outside investigator who might, with the help of a religious, psychological, or sociological guide to the interpretation of dreams, arrive at a facile explanation of this interesting case of suicide. But second, in my own interest, because having something to do brings me back to life. And so it goes. Now, he went on to write probably the work that he's most known for in North America, the screenplay for Winds of Desire, which was made into a film by Wim Wender. Uh, he also wrote the screenplay for the movie Paris, Texas, which is quite an amazing movie. And this is a very interesting, Wings of Desire is an interesting film set in Berlin in the Cold War. And it focuses on angelic beings, but instead of wings, they wear long shapeless trench coats and they hang out in the public library and beam out rays of hope to the unfortunate humans who pass on the streets. And Daniel, our, our protagonist angel, falls in love with Marion, who is an acrobat in a bit circus, and he wants to experience the emotions of being human. And here is one of his major speeches. It's great to live by the spirit, to testify day by day for eternity. Only what's spiritual in people's minds. But sometimes I'm fed up with my spiritual existence. Instead of forever hovering above, I'd like to feel a weight grow in me to end the infinity and tie me to the earth. I'd like at each step, each gust of wind to be able to say now, now, and now, and no longer forever and for eternity. To sit at an empty place at a card table and be greeted by a nod. No, I don't have to beget a child or plant a tree, but it would be rather nice coming home after a long day to feed the cat, to have a fever and blackened fingers from the newspaper to be excited not only by the mind, but at last by a meal, by the line of a neck, by an ear, to lie through one's teeth as you're walking, to feel your bones moving. Now, after Wings of Desire, he wrote a very short book, 83 pages, Across the Rivers, Justice to Serbia. And this is an essay, it's a meditative essay, part traveler, where he set out with two Serbian friends to the border and looked into Bosnia. And he writes his reflections, heavily influenced by his mother's experience. He went on to write uh, another book about the Nazi occupation of Austria and the Serbian partisan movement where the Serbs hid in the forests. And this little book, Storm Still, received a number of awards. He talks about the partisans and the plants. They introduce more and more false resistance into our groups who play partisans and in truth betray us, our camps, our bunkers. These ragged devils speak our language. They come from our people 
and yet are the henchmen of the master race, which can stay genteelly in the background and wash its hands and plead ignorance, as everywhere in Europe, from Oradour to Ukraine. Ragged devils, Ragrazanski, dividing us, disguised as pickers of mushrooms and of mountain meadow herbs, would sort them again in their rucksacks. What's the saying? Snakes that hide their legs. Only once did one betray himself. I am a partisan, he introduced himself, with a German S instead of a Slav partisan. We've got you. Hung by the feet from a mountain meadow pine, his head in an ant heap. And there's one little part in this book where he's, he talks about what the Germans did to the little farm. He said they burned the bee house with a flamethrower. They hung a neighbor's child upside down in a plum tree. And here is the last little bit of dialogue. It's actually a series of monologues. And it's monologues between the living and dead of his relatives. The woman remembering, and the treading of the sauerkraut, the picking of the cucumbers, the man, and the wintering of the turnips in the fields, the woman, and the storing of the apples in the cellar, the man, and our sons and daughters entering the good room, the woman, holy was peace, holy, holy, holy. The man, without politics, without emperor, without republic, we farmed our farm, the woman, and were our own kings, the man, were the kings of the feast. That's how it was, peace. And where are they now, the kings, the woman? The kings of peace are dead. They found nothing more to farm, the man. And what will the coming peace be like, the woman, if it comes? Sometimes it seems to me that the end of the world has already come. Now everything is only as if, as if peace came, as if the world existed, as if there were children. The man, and you say that, the woman, and I say that. Now, looking at his body of work, we have some understanding of journey to the rivers, justice for Serbia where he is coming from, but there has been an enormous scandal. There is a petition of 38,000 people objecting to Hunter's being awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, and his publisher put out a 24-page uh, defense. The Swedish Academy said that Peter Hunter is not political, he is a writer of great literature, and uh, they said that at no time in the writing does he disrespect civil society or the equality of individuals. And yet, he went to uh, both the trial and the funeral, which occurred uh, in the middle of the trial because uh, the war criminal, or being tried for war criminal, Slobodan Milosevic, uh, died in the middle of the criminal uh, trial and Hunker went. So he became the object of scandal, and if we look at Colette, we see that scandal became fame, and fame was turned into scandal. And I was listening to an interview with Peter Hunker, and he said he lives in the cargo uh, just outside Paris, and he said, there are 50 reporters at the gate and they're yelling at me, and not one of them knows my work or has read my work. He said, I am not a political writer. I am a writer. I come from Tolstoy and Homer and Cervantes. And we have to make up our own mind about literature and social justice. And if we look at what is the purpose of art, it has been said that art holds up a mirror to give us a context in which we can say anything. So tonight the King of Sweden is going to present Peter Hanke with the award. Now we move on to 
2018, the prize winner, the Polish writer, uh, 59 years old, uh, Olga Tokarczuk. And she is uh, a national treasure. Someone said about her that she's one of the most famous writers in the world who, uh, you have probably never heard of. She is a public intellectual, a feminist, an animal rights activist, an eco-activist, and the writer of nine novels. Uh, she's the winner of a long line of prizes, including the 2018 Man Booker International Award. Her final novel, or her last novel, was also nominated for the 2019 Man Booker, and she won in 2015 uh, a German-Polish <coughs> prize for her work, uh, which uh, a writer who promotes peace, democracy, and uh, communication between people and nations in Europe. Her writing is quite extraordinary. She studied, uh, she grew up also on a border. She grew up on the Polish-Czechoslovakian border. She had a Ukrainian grandmother, and both the writers, Hanke and uh, Tukarczuk, have a lot of writing about borders in many of their works, interestingly also, of angels. Borders and angels, there must be a connection. And she studied psychology. She became uh, a psychologist and worked at a youth facility as a specialist in addiction. And she quit after some years because she said she felt she was more neurotic than her clients. <laughs> <laughs> now, the book that she is best known for is an extraordinary book called Flights. And it has a postmodern uh, format in that it has a tangled narrative. And she made the observation that Polish writing is different from Western writing because when you have had your borders taken away, your country not even on the map for 123 years, your language taken, and the right to express yourself freely, your literature is very different from the, uh, the linear narrative more common in the West coming from the psychoanalytic background. Now, the, the book leapt onto the literary scene and is quite amazing. Uh, she, she calls it a constellation work. And she defines a constellation work as a book where you throw essays and sketches and short stories up in the air and let the reader's imagination do what we will with them. So we have an extraordinary book where uh, Chopin's heart is removed from his body on his death and transported from the place of his death, Paris, back to Warsaw. We have a 17th century anatomist who writes a letter to his amputated leg. Uh, we have a wandering <laughs> Scandinavian set, and in between, we have the narrator who appears to do little other than wander through airports, across time and space, and hurtle through time and space on night trains. And she says, I think there are a lot of people like me who aren't around, who disappear. They show up all of a sudden in the arrivals terminal and start to exist when the immigration officers stamp their passports, or when the polite receptionist at whatever hotel hands over their keys. By now they must have become aware of their own instability and dependence upon places, times of day, on language or on a city and its atmosphere. Fluidity, mobility, illusoriness, these are precisely the qualities that make us civilized. Barbarians don't travel. They simply go to destinations or conduct raids. <laughs> and she has a wonderful section on airports. And as I see it, in her book, 
she presents the idea that the airport, the international airport, has replaced the town hall. The, the airport has become like a small city and that we move back and forth through the airport uh, more easily and more frequently than we go to the town hall or God forbid the village square. She says, airports are more than travel hubs. This is a special category of city state with a stable location but citizens in flux. They are airport republics members of a world airport union, and while they aren't yet represented at the UN, it is only a matter of time. They are an example of a system where internal politics matter less than ties with other airport members of the union, for only these provide them with their raison d'etre, an example of an extroverted system where the constitution is spelled out on every ticket and where one's boarding pass is one's only identification as a citizen. In the middle of the night, as the train creeps along the plains of Belgium or Le Bouche, as the nighttime mist thickens and blurs everything, the cafe car is host to a second round of visitors, exhausted, insomniac passengers who are not ashamed of the slippers on their unstockinged feet they join in with the rest as though putting themselves in fate's hands. Whatever will be, will be. And she says, a fundamental concept in travel psychology is desire, which is what lends movement and direction to human beings, as well as arousing in them an inclination towards something. Desire in itself is empty. In other words, it merely indicates direction, but never destination. In any case, destination always remains phantasmagoric and unclear. The closer we get to destinies, the more enigmatic they become. By no means is it possible to ever actually attain a given destination, nor in doing appease desire. This process of striving is best encapsulated in the preposition toward. Toward what? <coughs> a person who is sleeping and loses any sense of the place in which he or she currently is also loses all sense of time. The more courses in space and the more places we experience, therefore, the more time elapses subjectively we often refer to separate stages of time as episodes. They have no consequences, interrupting time without becoming part of it. They are self-contained occurrences, each starting from scratch. Each beginning and each end is absolute. Not a single episode is to be continued, you might say. And then she says, why am I in pain? Is it because, as that lens grinder says, and perhaps only in this does he not err, in essence, the body and soul are part of something larger and something shared, states of the same substance, like water, that can be both liquid and solid. How can what does not exist cause me pain why do I feel this lack, sense this absence? Are we perhaps condemned to wholeness and every fragmentation, every quartering will only be a pretense, will happen on the surface, underneath which, however, the plan remains intact, unalterable? Does even the smallest fragment still belong to the whole? If the world, like a great glass orb, falls and shatters into a million pieces, doesn't something great powerful and infinite remain a whole in this. And talking about travel, at first you always see what's alive and vibrant. You're delighted by nature, by the local church painted in different colors, 
by the smells and all that. But the longer you're in a place, the more the charm of those things fades. You wonder lived here before you came to this home and this room, whose things these are, who scratched the wall above the bed, and what tree the sills were cut from, whose hands built the elaborately decorated fireplace, paved the courtyard, and where are they now, in what form? Whose idea led to these paths around the pond, and who had the idea of planting a willow out the window? All the houses, avenues, parks, gardens, and streets are permeated with the deaths of others. Once you start feeling this, something starts to pull you elsewhere. You start to think it's time to move on. Now, the next book that she wrote, which was also nominated for the Man Booker International this year, is the Constellation Selection of Notes. <laughs> Drive your plow over the bones of the dead. This is the story uh, of an eccentric, elderly, ex-school teacher, astrologer, who lives uh, in a remote village and looks after, in the winter, the homes of the wealthy uh, people who come from Warsaw. She has a particularly intense relationship with animals. Uh, of which there are many wild animals in the area. And uh, in the course of her watching out for the animals, there are three murders in the area. Each murder is a prominent citizen, the head of the police and two other influential people. And the novel tracks down the murderers and also talks a lot about animals. And this is the book that the right pole, the right wing of the Polish government has denounced as uh, anti-Christian uh, and uh, filled with eco-terrorism, which as you'll see is a little bit strong. Uh, so let's take a look at Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. And I chose the selections quite unabashedly for those of us who are animal lovers. And Niagara on the Lake is a town where uh, there are at least six dogs and their people on the street at any one time. <laughs> so she says she goes to City Hall to protest the slaughter of a wild boar. And she says, animals show the truth about a country. I said, its attitude toward animals. If people behave brutally toward animals, no form of democracy is ever going to help them. In fact, nothing will at all, which was very much Gandhi's idea. He said that you can judge the integrity of a society by the way we treat animals and the elderly. In fact, man has a great responsibility towards wild animals to help them to live their lives and it's uh, to help them to live their lives and it's his duty towards domesticated animals to return their love and affection for they give us far more than they receive from us and they need to be able to live their lives with dignity to be able to settle their accounts and register their semester in the karmic index i was an animal i lived and i ate I grazed in green pastures. I bore young. I kept them warm with my body. I built nests. I performed my duty. When you kill them and they die in fear and terror, like that boar whose body lay before me yesterday and is still lying there defiled, muddy, and smeared with blood, reduced to carrion, you doom them to hell, and the whole world changes into hell. Can't people see that? Are their minds incapable of reaching beyond petty, selfish pleasures? People have a duty towards animals to lead them in successive lives to liberation. We're all traveling in the same direction, 
from dependence to freedom, from ritual to free choice. Speaking of wild animals, they were more human than people in every possible way, more affectionate, wiser, more joyful, and people think they can do what they want to animals as if they're just things. I think my dogs were shot by hunters. Well, the plot gets quite dark at that point. Olga Tokarczuk has received a lot of scandalous publicity also because of a book she wrote in 2015, or was published in 2015, The Books of Jacob. And this is a close to 1,000 page work. Uh, and it describes a period in the 18th century in Poland. There are several things happening. One is a Jewish religious leader, Jacob Frank, who devised a way of converting Jews to uh, a Catholic orthodoxy. And concurrent with this description is a description of the gentry who used to ride through the country hunting and pillage and rape and enslave the peasants. And uh, the Polish right wing has denounced uh, Olga Tokarczuk as a traitor uh, for uh, writing about this period in Polish history. And her response to this criticism is, she said, I was very naive. I thought that uh, we Polish people would be open to discussing and exploring a dark period in our history. Clearly many were, and clearly some weren't. So the 2018 Prize for Literature and the 2019 Peter Hanke and Olga Tokarczuk, both of whom are concerned with borders. Tokarczuk says that the novel is a wonderful form of communication across borders, across cultures, across languages, and Peter Hanke talks constantly about borders. They're both talking about social justice one way or another, there's scandal surrounding them, and yet if we come back to Alfred Nobel and look at the sort of book that he was interested in, he was a skeptic, he was critical uh, of the middle range uh, of society, and uh, it's possible that uh, both of these prize winners reflect very much uh, Alfred Nobel's sensibility and taste in literature very accurately. The Nobel Prizes in Literature also have a history of social justice. Nadine Gordimer, who won the prize uh, for her writings, July's People, uh, about the police state of South Africa and apartheid. Uh, we see um, Doris Lessing's work. We see uh, works from many writers looking at the status quo, and this takes us back pre-Nobel Prize to Dickens. Charles Dickens' father was imprisoned in a debtor's prison. When he was 12 years old, Charles Dickens worked in a shoe blacking factory. Is it any wonder that Bleak House and Little Dorrit, uh, all of these came out of Dickens' own experience? And also, Dickens' work uh, was uh, instrumental in having the laws of England changed to prevent debtors from being imprisoned. We look at Victor Hugo, we look at Les Miserables, we see that his work also made changes. So there's a very fine line between being political, which is really a roving truth and depends on perspective, to write about social justice, to make change, and to be apolitical, and first and foremost, a writer. And I thought we'd finish today 
by looking at a writer who was awarded the prize purely for merit with no political overloading. And we come to Alice Munro, <laughs> who was awarded in 2013 the Nobel Prize in Literature. And let's come back to Olga Tokarczuk's statement again uh, that the literature of Poland in Central Europe is based on mythology and religion, and that in the West is based on psychoanalysis. And she explains the difference in tumbled narrative and linear narrative, and certainly in Canada, Alice Munro, who lives, who's 88 years old, who lives in the small town of Clinton, Ontario, uh, deals with human relationships, but there is a taking for granted that the main street of the small town or the borders of Canada and the US are going to pretty much stay that way. These are not up there in the constellation. Mm -hmm. And one critic wrote of Alice Munro, and she's written 14 books of short stories. The critic said, reading an Alice Munro story is like watching a cat walk across a fully made dinner table. We have the ordinary and there's a tension. And I'm reading to close from Dear Life. And Dear Life, the actual story, Dear Life, the eponymous Dear Life, uh, is very autobiographical, Munro confirms. Something had come upon us that was even more unexpected and would become more devastating than the loss of income, though we didn't know it yet. It was the early onset of Parkinson's disease, which showed up when my mother was in her 40s. At first, it was not too bad. Her eyes only rarely turned up into her head in a wandering way, and the soft down from an oversupply of saliva was just visible around her lips. She could get dressed in the mornings with some help, and she was able to do occasional chores around the house. She held on to some strength in herself for a surprisingly long time. You would think that this was just too much. The business gone, my mother's health going. It wouldn't do in fiction, but the strange thing is that I don't remember that time as unhappy. There wasn't a particularly despairing mood around the house. Maybe it was not understood then that my mother wouldn't get any better, only worse. As for my father, he had his strength and would have it for a long time yet. He liked the men he worked with at the foundry, who were for the most part men like himself, who'd had some sort of downturn or extra burden added to their lives. He liked the challenging work he did in addition to being the early night watchman. That work involved pouring molten metal into molds. The foundry made old fashioned stoves that were sold all over the world. It was a dangerous job, but it was up to you to look out as my father said. And there was decent pay, a novelty for him. I believe he was glad to get away, even to do this hard and risky work to get out of the house and into the company of other men who had their own problems, but made the best of things. Once he was gone, I'd start on supper. I could make things that I thought were exotic, like spaghetti or omelets, as long as they were cheap. And after the dishes are done, my sister had to, were done, my sister had to dry them, and my brother had to be nagged into throwing the dishwasher out over the dark field. I could do that myself, I'd like to give him orders. I sat down with my feet in the warming oven, which had lost its store, and read the big novels I borrowed from the town library, Independent People, which was about life in Iceland, harder than ours by far, but with a hopeless grandeur to it, or Remembrance of Things Past, which was about nothing I could understand at all, but was not on that account to be given up on, or the magic mountain about tuberculosis and containing a great argument between what went on one side seemed to, be a, uh, seemed to be a genial and progressive notion of life and on the other, a 
and dark and somehow thrilling despair. I never did homework in this precious time, but when exams came, I buckled down and stayed up almost all night, cramming my head with whatever I was supposed to know. I had a prodigious short-term memory, and that worked quite well for what was required. Against several odds, I believed myself a lucky person. Well, Alice Munro went on to get the Nobel Prize, so I think we would all agree that she was not only lucky, but wonderfully talented. Thank you all for coming today. Consensus right now is that we're no looking we need the Nobel winners. I'm no looking no longer looking for a moralistic idealism of good or bad, right. but rather uh, an accurate portrayal, uh, almost a relentless portrayal of the human condition and the human predicament. Well, I I understood that that was what. Driving it, but I'm wondering if these works don't lay open some moralizing in the way that they show us how we fall short, and that it's not just this sort of relentless um, representation. We could we could have a long discussion about this and look at the various uh, winners. Uh, if you look, for example, a 2016 uh, prize winner, Bob Dylan, uh, who won the prize for taking modern poetry uh, into the direction of American traditional songwriting, uh, is this uh, moving in uh, an idealistic direction? Well, if you're a Bob Dylan fan, certainly, and the, the times they are changing. Uh, if you look at all of these works, and you look at Tocatrol, she won the, uh, the German Polish Award, International Award, for her work to promote peace, democracy, and understanding. And if you look at Peter Hunke, this uh, clearly has become political. Mm -hmm. And so whether you look at uh, the Do we have the Nobel literature? I'm moving along just to look at why the awards are um, presented. Ah, here we go. Here are the prize winners, Olga and Peter. And Peter Hunker won for an influential work that with linguistic ingenuity has explored the periphery and the specificity of human experience. Every Nobel Prize winner has a different um, uh, rationale for the award. And 
uh, some are deemed to be uplifting and an idealistic direction, some are awarded more for linguistics. So there's obviously a lot of um, play within the 18 members of the Academy, or perhaps 16 after tonight, when two members have threatened to quit over the Hanke uh, controversy. And uh, Olga Tokarczuk, for a narrative imagination that with encyclopedic passion represents the crossing of borders as a way of life. And then we have our own Alice Munro. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much.